Hello everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Inspired in Berlin podcast. My guest today is Stefan Kalinski, um the the author and initiator of a modern retelling of old classics, fairy tales retold. Um Stefan has a impressive resume. There's um so many things in there that I'm literally just going to pick a few things off his LinkedIn profile and then um let you Stefan introduce yourself. Thank you. Hello. Um, um so you you start with accounting you go to product management um you were in US you were in UK um you started your own business um something to do with baby products um you yeah. produced a movie um you have done business development you have been an organizer and speaker curator for TEDx um and now you're the founding part of Nasimo Trading and uh, Fairy Tales Retold <laughs> so Um even though we're going to talk a lot about fairy tales um welcome to the podcast and feel free to reintroduce yourself uh, for our listeners. Very <laughs> first of all thank you very much for having me. It's uh, it's, it's really fun. I'm excited. Um yes as we, as I was just saying earlier it's a resume that's hard to um get a job with because it's so um it seems a bit random. But uh, essentially I I ended up in in the US for university uh, in Los Angeles did some um international business there or oh, that's what I studied. and then after a uh, university i ended up on the other side of the of the country and helped my brother with his first startup and that was in the field of um medical software or right. sleep management sleep management software so a field i had no idea about but um we were somehow getting along work work wise so we started that um sadly as with most uh, software and tech and first startups it, it failed for a number of reasons um but then Uh, my brother uh, since he's a bit older he he had another idea and we went into the kind of transport space again a bit techy uh, mm-hmm. and i helped him for a couple of years and then i had the chance to actually do something myself uh, and that's when the first um, that was the first venture in the kind of the kids slash baby space and we um, were involved 15 years, long time ago 15 years ago a little longer even in what at that time at that time was a new kind of wave it was cloth diapers so it was reusable diapers but just with much more modern fabrics and materials uh, we specialized in a in a hemp kind of using hemp as as, as the main material um it was environmentally friendly it was it's better for the baby it was better for the environment um better for the pocket um the problem there was i didn't have kids yet so it was a hard product to uh it was a fun product to do but it was hard to uh I didn't have the first hand experience uh, right. that I probably could have used. Um but it was quite fun and the company still exists. Um and then uh, my girlfriend at the time or my girlfriend still she was living in London so I went back and forth a lot and uh while there um I I connected with some old high school friends who were involved with TEDx and uh since I was spending a lot of time in London I uh, had the chance to help them organize tech conferences. and now they and I did that for a number of years and now they um they run TEDx London so it's which is probably one of the best TEDx events in in Europe I would say uh it was an incredible experience because you just get such a wide array of speakers and and topics uh, yeah and it was just something completely different what I'd never done before um and then what happened then my girlfriend and I, we had our first child or the first child was on the way and we thought hey let's live in the same city slash country again and we ended up moving to berlin um that was seven years ago and then i figured okay i need to earn some money what uh what <laughs> what can i do and i i, I um, connected with another friend and we ended up setting up a um a consulting firm where we helped the uh, german well we european but mostly german businesses expand to, to the us uh, on I the see. logistics operation side that's nasimo trading um which still i still run uh but a little bit less now um uh, because now two years ago i uh, stumbled into um this latest project which is uh it's called fairy tales we told and that really it just happened by accident because i was reading um fairy tales to my daughter she was around 5 at that time and we got really well she was 5 and she started asking or started really worrying about the way she looks and my girlfriend and i were really confused and and, and frustrated because we never kind of um we never really emphasized that point <coughs> that and we wanted her just to have fun and be a normal little kid um but then one of those evenings we were reading um Snow White 
and then I thought, kind of like a light bulb went off in my head. I thought, okay, if I was her, I'm five, if we were reading the story, what message would I take? Am I taking away from this? Um, probably mm -hmm. one of the main ones is, you know, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest slash prettiest of them all. Um, it's probably, hey, I need to worry about how I look. How I look is very, very important in life. And, um, oh yeah, it really got me frustrated. And then just for fun, we started changing um, initially just one word. So from the, uh, the fairest slash uh, prettiest in the world, uh, it became, it turned into the bravest in the land. Yeah. And uh, she thought it was really funny. And I thought it was really amazing what just one little word could do, right? And these little changes and what the impact could be. And that's how we kind of stumbled into um, fairy tales we told, and that's how we how we connected. <laughs> wow! Um, so I definitely want to come back to um, the stories themselves and the changes yeah. and the reasons behind them. And um, but um, first, I want to get into the process of going from that light bulb moment to actually yeah. producing um, something like this, ah, which yes. is beautiful. Um, just want to open this up and it's amazingly well illustrated. Um, it's, it's good to hold in your hands. I'm sure the kids love it <laughs> and the parents um, love reading it. I definitely loved uh, reading through it. Um, I also listened to the um, audio version of the story. Uh, but before we get into the stories, how yeah. do you come to this? Um, who well, did you I talk to? <laughs> <laughs> well, initially, um... At the same time, I was also working with a friend from TEDx London, and we were planning actually to do a podcast. Or I really wanted to do a podcast. And then we thought, okay, what kind of topics could we do? Or what would be kind of nice formats? Uh, and among one of them, we thought, hey, maybe we can do something with kids. Um, because it was just something I was really interested in, you know, have the kids at the, at the right age, so to speak. And he's a teacher, so it kind of fit. So um, when I started changing the words, um, I was talking, his name is Ian, and I write with him. And I said, ah, maybe this could be kind of the first idea for our podcast. So that's why don't we just, and initially, why don't we just change a word here or there, make it, an, make it uh, recorded, and kind of have a podcast series. And he said, okay, sure, how hard can that be? <laughs> so we got, uh, we got started to writing. Um, but then there was a moment, because when we had now then two kids at the time, usually the kids are very loud. And they always fight. Something always happens. When they play, it's always just loud. But all of a sudden, it was one evening or afternoon, I was sitting at the desk and the kids were here and it was just really quiet for five, ten minutes. And every time it's quiet for that long, it's very suspicious. So something <laughs> really that. <laughs> but then I was looking and I saw them sitting together on the sofa looking at a, at a, at a book. And really just, they were just amazed at the pictures. Yeah. And, I thought, and then I thought, okay, really... Just, just doing an audio version is, 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 is only half the step. We really should do it properly. Um, get a, a illustrative, I mean, have a book series, like a hardcover, something you can feel and touch and you can look uh, into. So then, um, so they kind of took this project idea to another um, level of complexity. Uh, and then simply what we did is we just looked at a lot of kids' books uh, in, in various uh, ways. So one was how kind of, what kind of format? Should it be like a soft cover, a hard cover? How big should it be? Uh, and how, how, in terms of sizing, right? What's kind of yeah. comfortable to hold when you lie in bed and, and trying to turn the page and read? Um, how many pictures should there be? So we went to bookstores and just looked at kids', kids books. Uh, how much should they cost? So the same thing, we just looked at kids' books. Okay, this has that many illustrations, cost about this much, this is this big, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and at the same time, we just kept kind of writing the stories and, and changing it. And the more we were writing, the more we realized, oh, it would be fun to kind of make tweaks here and there and it just kind of took on a life of its own um, and then of course since we've never done this before uh, I wanted to have a local printer just so we can talk to them and, and say hey what kind of paper to use how long does it take how much does it cost um, yeah and that's why that's kind of how it all kind of came together we just asked a lot of questions um, talked a little got a lot of help from friends another friend of mine is a um, um, she does layout and design, so she helped us with just laying out the book and saying, hey, you need to think about the font because you want the kids, you want it to be a kid-friendly font, but it also needs to be easy to read and you have to have yeah. the right size and all these kind of elements. Or when you do create pictures, make sure there's space to put text, right? I mean, all these little things that you really usually don't, uh, wouldn't think about is, is kind of, uh, yeah, it just all added on to the, yeah. <laughs> to the list of things to, to figure out and learn and, and do. 
uh, but it was a tremendous amount of fun. Um, yeah. That's um, that's amazing. So you're not new to business, right? So you have done some of these things in in your previous <laughs> lives. Let's say figuring mm-hmm. out how to get something off the ground. Uh, were there any uh, particular lessons in this journey where you were like, "Oh, this is new. Um, I didn't come to uh, um, something similar before." It was not so much. I mean, as you're right, because uh, kind of since after college, I always uh, was working in a, in a place where you had to figure it out yourself, or you had to ask questions and, and get help. So it was always um, a learning process. So it was not much, so much. Um, it was maybe surprising how many elements are involved. And uh, I think what I underestimated is actually the, the side of kind of the bookstore side, the logistics side on that end. Right? It's nice to have a book, but then how do you get it into people's hands? Yeah. Um, that's a bit still, at least in Germany, what we learned, a bit antiquated, that whole system. Um, and then we said, okay, maybe for us it's not the, the easiest or the best, or we don't have the time or the resources to go this traditional route. And maybe we try to figure out a different way of distributing and, and spreading the word. And the other thing I was shocked, because we actually initially we thought maybe we can do it with the publisher, but just the um, the ratio is quite rough in terms of what the mm. writer gets <laughs> versus what the uh, com- publishing company gets. Um, yeah, and how long it takes. So mm. I think when you have um, when you send your manuscript or, or your book to to a publisher, a the chance that they respond to you is just very very small, right? Because yeah. if you have no name, you've never done anything like this. It's it's unlikely somebody's going to read it or take you seriously. And then the other thing I've now noticed or heard from friends who who've done this traditional route, it just takes publishers just a long, long time to actually get a book to market, like yeah. two years or something, from idea to um, yeah, to having it in your hand. We did the first book from the first. <laughs> which was, of course, very insane. But from the first idea to having it in our hands, we did it in three and a half months. Wow. That's not which, bad at all. It's insane, especially when you think about um, the illustrator we found. We have about 50 images, and it takes about... It should take about two days per image to draw, uh, right? If you do it... Uh, if, if, there's, if you have enough time. But we had a very condensed schedule. But yeah, the, the illustration alone takes a long time. Then the, the, the trick is just, okay, you have a printer, but actually what you need, the, the, the bottleneck here in Germany at least, is are these um, people that bind books. Because um, yeah. if you don't want it glued, you want it like a proper paper, hardcover. Uh, if you want it to look uh, and feel kind of very, um, what's the word? Um, proper. It, it's very hard to find these binders because there's apparently, mm-hmm. there's a couple that just do large volumes and there's a, a couple ones, very niche ones that do tiny bones. But if you're looking for something in, in the middle, there's only maybe two or three in the whole country that do it. And then they're the bottleneck yeah. in terms of time. Mm. So. Wow, a lot of variables in there. Um, and you guys yeah. managed that in three and a half months. That's um, pretty good. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, of course, we made a lot of mistakes. Uh, the first book we had, uh, we did it actually in two languages. So the first we printed in English and German. Um, of course, spelling mistakes and all these things just happened. But... Um, wouldn't be, I think, a real book without a spelling mistake here or there. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. Uh, um, so um, let's um, switch gears a bit to mm-hmm. the stories themselves. Um, yeah. So how many stories have you done? What is the plan with this? So um, initially, we just wanted to do this one, right? I thought, hey, this would be a cool proof of concept for the whole podcasting idea. Um, mm-hmm. But then um, it really switched. We really realized, hey, maybe... Uh, a, it is, it's, we realized it's a concept that really people really uh, like and there was a need. We said, okay, maybe let's switch to to now make, instead of just one book, maybe make a series of six to ten books. Um, and the uh, kind of we evolved the original idea, right? Originally it was just changing one word can change everything. That was kind of our tagline. Uh, but then we realized, hey, um, maybe let's focus on keeping, trying to keep these stories very similar the, so that they're very recognizable. Because there's no point in, in retelling a story that then people, when they read it, say, huh, this is not Cinderella or this is not uh, Snow White. So you want to yeah. make sure that the kind of the story arc and the story is, is the same. So kids, especially kids, can recognize, hey, this is still what I kind of think it is. Um, but then he said, hey, maybe what we should do is focus on uh, having one or two major themes per story. So yeah. in, in Snow White, it was about taking the focus away from the way you look 
to personal character being brave and, and overcoming your fear and learning and evolving. Um, the second story which we're doing now and which is uh, coming in, in June is, is Cinderella and there it's going to be about self-confidence. Mm -hmm. um, because Ian, the, the person I write with, he's a teacher, he said, hey, the, the thing I, I see a lot in schools is this whole self-confidence issue. It's really, really a big kind of topic. And we were debating for Cinderella, hey, should we make it about that or maybe bullying? Um, but we thought, okay, this could really fit. So now the idea is that we take each story and, and have one or two major themes. Right. Um, but on top of that, um, what we realized, hey, visually, it's really, really important, or we really think it's important to have a, images that are appealing, just that, that are nicely drawn, but that are also that you have characters that are very diverse or diverse that represent kind of the world we live in today, right? So yeah. traditionally, especially these fairy tales or these green tales, were a collection gathered here in Germany, and then they kind of spread and became quite popular. And Disney, of course, made a had a huge impact on that. But when you look at a lot of these traditional drawings, just the way the characters are drawn is, is very bland, very, you know, uh, white old men a lot of times. Mm. Uh, but also what is really, um, yeah, so diversity is missing. And, but also, especially with these princesses, most of these are princess stories. They're incredibly passive. Right? These mm. princesses, it's just somebody just comes, kisses them, saves them, and then they're off to get married, right? There's no depth, so there's no reason to, why is somebody bad or evil? Why are they... There's just no depth to it. So we're trying to, with little adjustments here and there, kind of um, make these stories much more timely and, and um, yeah, something for today's world. Yeah. Amazing. Um, I want to get into the details of all of that, but we have been talking about um, the story behind the stories. Um, yes. So I want to remind our listeners and, and viewers, um, if they want to follow more of you, they can go to fairy, fairy tales. Uh, dash retold.com or they can find you at fairy tales retold on instagram um i'm gonna put yes. it in the, into the show notes as well um um i want to jump into into the story um yeah and i've got the snow white um with me here so once upon a time long <coughs> long ago an adventurous king and wise queen ruled over distant land i think this is more or less similar um, to, to the Brother Grimm's uh, beginning. Um, but it starts to change um, when, when we come to the Queen's wish. Um, the wish happens in a similar fashion, um, blood falling onto the windowsill and the Queen uh, wishing for, for a child. Um, but then the Queen eventually, after giving birth to the baby girl, um, fall sick yes um and this is where some of the changes start so what, um, it actually starts one the one step before right traditionally um it's it's in, in snow white and she wishes for a child ribs uh, lips as red as blood a hair as dark as as the wood of the window frame and mm -hmm. um skin as white as snow indeed uh, indeed and then when we so what we did we wrote the first version and we had this kind of traditional uh, setup and we send it out for feedback, and then uh, people ask us, hey, "Why you want to keep make diverse stories? Why do you why do you have to put a focus on the skin color?" Mm -hmm. And we say, "Ah, and this is kind of what shows us it's so helpful to have constant feedback, right? That's why we also always send things out and, and, and get feedback." So then we said, "Okay, obviously this is silly. There's no point for it. So we had to find a different characteristic to kind of keep the, the rhythm of the three, uh, but find something that we can." Uh, Put instead of the the focus on the skin color, so we did that, and mm -hmm. then and then we come to the uh, thing that changes visually in the story. Where yeah, it, I think what you're implying with the dad probably, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, thank you for um, for reminding me of this. Um, I completely overlooked it uh, reading. But now, that's the point. Like, I mean, so that's the goal that we we make change and you don't realize it. That the, the story yeah. kind of keeps its natural flow. But yeah, so that's one of the mm. things we're trying to do. <laughs> in, indeed. So, um, so the first point about this kind of um, the subconscious stereotypes, right? Um, as you already alluded to, the the fair princess, um, mm -hmm. kind of we stop questioning it because it's become part of our psyche. Perhaps reading all these stories um, or the images that have been told to us, um, and it's just as simple as that, tweaking it. Yeah, and and if, for example, one one question we asked in a questionnaire that we sent out is, how how should uh, Snow White look? And it was 
scary or, or it depends how you look at it, but it was a bit worrying to see how people had no, they just they automatically quoted or, or said, hey, she should look like the Disney version. It was so ingrained in people's minds. You just couldn't think of another way she should look. Yeah. Uh, so that was a bit uh, scary. Um, yeah, so we, so we played a lot around with that. And um, it's also, usually what happens is you have these characters, especially um, any step uh, character that's a step, like a stepmother, stepbrother, stepdad, or they always have such a negative connotation. And uh, that has historical uh, reasons for it. But I think nowadays it's, it's also completely uh, changed, right? So all, that's also one of the elements we, we wanted to play with, say, hey, a person, for example, in our story, the evil queen is not evil from the beginning, but she's actually nice at the beginning, but she turns evil. So I would yeah. argue, or we would argue, you're not born evil, right? Something happens along life that kind of changes you and your character changes. So we try to kind of uh, suggest or, or give some hints why she turns that way, and then the kids kind of ask questions. Yeah. No, um, good stuff. Um, before we get to the queen, uh, the king, um, this was for me um, a very sweet part of the story. Um, I'm not going to give it away, please. <laughs> yes, um, that's when people, we sell at, at market stalls, and that's when people flick through the story, that's all, they always chuckle. Because we wanted to, um, in these original stories, right, the, so right, the, the mother dies, uh, and you just have a single dad, basically. And we wanted to kind of show, hey, single dad, what does that mean? What could that mean? And we wanted to illustrate. Uh, what a what a single dad uh, could be doing with uh, with his kids. So he ends up uh, changing the diaper. He ends up teaching her stuff and just spending time with her. Uh, so we wanted to show, hey, it's not only it's kind of more a modern, um, uh, yeah, representation of how how society is nowadays. Right? It's much more mm -hmm. accepted that dads can take uh, time off when kids are born. That they take um, apps, uh, family leave, etc. So we wanted to kind of um, play, play with that a bit and show that visually. Yeah, um, so definitely um, we're already in a modern retelling of the story, <laughs> not just um, <laughs> changes of values. Um, and then comes the queen um, and eventually Snow White finds her way um, to the dwarves. Um, what happens along there? What were the things that stood out for you and that you started to think differently about? <coughs> so one, we wanted to show... Um... As I mentioned earlier, we wanted to show why she turned evil, the queen. So we, mm -hmm. we give a couple, um, we explain that a bit and show that to kids. Um, the other thing we wanted to do is we wanted to, um, we wanted to show, since she's not the prettiest anymore, the, the fairest, right? And that's something mm -hmm. that you don't have to explain, right? It's something you draw and you see. We wanted to, uh, since she's the bravest, we wanted to uh, mm -hmm. kind of show or explain how she becomes that way. So there's yeah. a couple things that happened that show, hey, look, she, she at first maybe was not brave, was a bit uh, scared, but she evolves and becomes changes and mm -hmm. becomes the bravest. Uh, so that's one thing we wanted to, one element we wanted to show. Uh, the other element um, that we kind of played with is in the original story, which again is, is happened in a lot of other stories, she's very passive. She, she mm -hmm. doesn't, when the hunter takes her to the forest, she, um, in the original, she, the hunter has, takes pity on her. Um, mm. But we didn't want that. We wanted her to be a bit more self-determined, so she escapes uh, by herself, right? And then um, runs to the magic forest and finds the dwarfs. So that's kind of the elements mm -hmm. we, we, we played with. Um, but again, what we're trying to do is, is keep it in this kind of fairy tale setting, just the way it's drawn, and also with the language, trying to not have it too modern. Just keep, keep the fairy tale setting, but have the, uh, introduce these elements. So she's much more self-determined. Uh, we explain why the queen uh, changes her character. And... Um, Mm. Why she becomes brave. Uh, um, I love this um, this idea of adding a bit of nuance to these stories. Um, and this, this <coughs> how did you come to this this idea? It was really just a step by step, right? So at first it was just the one word, and then we thought, okay, um, why does she have to be have white skin? Okay, and then the first thing we we one of the main elements we we changed was the dwarfs, but I'm sure we're gonna come to that. Um, and, and it's just we wanted to, um, it's not much, right? You have the story, but it's just adding half sentence here or there, you can do that. It doesn't take too much space and it, it yeah. gives you a little bit of depth, depth of character, right? Because, for example, usually the prince just comes and saves somebody. But who is the prince? Where does he come from? It's never, ever explained. So we thought, okay, maybe this is the chance uh, to just um, 
because I, remember, I guess both curious, saying, hey, if I was a kid reading this, maybe I had, kids always have questions, right? They want to know everything. They, why, 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 why this, why that? How does this work? So we thought, okay, maybe we'll take this kind of natural curiosity and try to include it a bit here and there where it makes sense. Yeah. yeah. How do you find the balance between um, giving away too many answers um, versus letting the kids um, play with their own imagination? Because um, I can imagine the prints would be different for, for different kids and they would make up yeah. all sorts of stories about it. I mean, it's, it's um, I don't know. I mean, the one hand, I, I, I sometimes when I hear my kids play or when they play with other kids, I, I, I write stuff down. Sometimes they have cool ideas or they ask right. funny questions. So I just, someone takes notes and you can kind of take it as a jumping point, right? For, say, ah, this right. is funny. Or this is a nice way of expressing things or thinking about things. Because they have, they have a completely different way of, 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 of uh, looking at the world, right? So sometimes I take notes and that kind of, then you know, ah, this is a cool element to include somewhere along the line. Um, but the other thing is just, Ian and I, we just, there's just a lot of writing. Uh, so a lot of editing and, and we write and then we go back and forth and then we change it all again and you just kind of iterate and sometimes you read out loud which really helps right because then you yeah. hear it differently and i think that's probably helped us uh, with snow white because originally it was an audio just an audio format right and then you kind of realize okay what works what needs tightening up and then we just get feedback uh, from people from other parents or from other people who we we know they have um they did, they're not afraid to, to give us a proper criticism. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this kind of, it just kind of, there's no one thing. It's just a little bit here and there, I guess. Yeah. How are you, um, how did your writing style develop? Because um, you, you have taken on a very interesting challenge. You're not creating something from scratch. Um, yes. And it almost feels harder to me to, to take a classic and still do justice to it. Um, how do, how do you guys work through this? It's actually, I, I kind of agree with you. Because at, at first we thought, hey, and like with Snow White, we took an original, we took one that was 150 years old, a version that we thought, okay, this is a cool base. So I literally took it yeah. and took that text and started changing things here and there. Uh, in the end, it became much, much longer and maybe only two or three sentences from the original were in it. But this kind of restraint um, we noticed with the second story, with, with Cinderella, that it's actually quite hard to um, take these stories because you need to keep certain elements in it to keep to make it recognizable. Yeah. Um, so it was quite it's a bit uh, tricky, um, and especially when you have stories like Cinderella is, is is a better example. When you have stories that are so well known, but the problem there is you have different versions that are very well known, and then you want to create one thing that kind of keeps the important elements. It makes it a bit challenging. Um, yeah, it's, it's actually harder, <laughs> but then, uh, <laughs> but we set up the stories also. Originally, I thought, hey, this is nice. We let's, we do six to ten stories. Uh, we writing them. We kind of learn and grow as writers because we, we, yeah. we kind of figure out how to do this and, and kind of get better at it. And then uh, in the second stage, we can add kind of completely new stories, uh, like volume two, for like Snow White volume two or whatever, uh, and yeah. then come up with that. But it has been proven a bit more tricky. <laughs> <laughs> um, we'll we'll get to that part. So let's talk about the dwarfs now. Um, yes. New names. New names. So this was the kind of after the changing from beauty to bravery. This was kind of the element we we got to very quickly. We said, hey, just look at Berlin, right? Berlin is a city that. When I came here after living abroad for a long time, it completely changed. It was just a much more vibrant, multicultural city, right? You yeah. walk through the city and you hear 10 different languages. I mean, it's not, not un un unusual. And we thought, hey, why don't we, how can we show this diversity in the story? And we thought, hey, it would be cool if the seven dwarves come from kind of roughly speaking from one of each comes from one of the seven continents. Again. Right. Um, so that was one of the ideas that we wanted to have. Um, have them look diverse. Um, and then the question was, okay, where did they come from? So we kind of had a look on the map and said, hey, this would be, um, this would be fun. Um, and then when it came to the names, we picked names. So two names in this, of the dwarfs are, are traditional boys' names, two names are traditional girls' names, and three of the names are unisex names. Uh, and right. we also drew the dwarfs so that kids themselves can choose or decide if they want to 
hey, is this a boy or a girl? Or it doesn't yeah. really matter. Uh, just the kids can decide. Uh, so we want to have kind of this uh, uh, take away the focus, I guess, on the sex, but the, of, of the is it a boy or a girl, and just show because it, it's really uh, what we've learned or seen is is when a child can kind of su- it can identify themselves with some sort of element in the story or in one of the characters, say, hey, look, I have the same skin or the same hair or I have glasses, whatever it is, it mm. really has a much stronger connection. Yeah. Um, so we wanted to kind of show that also with the dwarves. Mm. Um, but the tricky thing is we re- didn't realize, so in English and German, you can write the story without giving away the sex of the character. Yeah. But not every, not every language allows you to do that, which we noticed now when we, when we started yeah. translating to other languages. Um, mm. Makes it a bit tricky. In other languages, you have to give a character, you have to mm-hmm. assign a sex. You have to say, hey, is it a boy or a girl? Yeah. But interesting. That's that's going to be quite a challenge. <laughs> yes. Again, you learn. You learn. Um, but yeah. So and, and um, actually, when we yeah. Uh, so sorry, one more thing. So when we now uh, talk to kids, the dwarves is the first thing they see, initially, and then they notice like how how different they look or how similar they look, and it's really they're really drawn to yeah. these kind of characters, which is really fun. Wow. And it took uh, us a I've long been... time. Sorry, the last point. It took us like twenty or thirty iterations to find the right dwarfs. We have like so many variations of them it, it's it's a bit silly but sorry i'm done wow um no an image came to my mind of um auditioning for dwarfs in berlin um because berlin is such a city that i think everybody has their own unique seven dwarfs um and th- yes they come from all over they speak different languages yeah. and they're all amazing um so so you guys uh, found your dwarfs um if I remember correctly, um, at least in the English version, the naming of the dwarves um, mm-hmm. kind of pointed towards their characters. Um, a little and, bit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Was so that what, a consideration? A little bit. I mean, so when we were looking for names, which is quite challenging, because we don't have names that kind of work in, in mm. every setting. Um, what we then... Um, Every uh, every dwarf's name kind of has a characteristic, or the name kind of um, means something. For example, we have a name, uh, one of the dwarfs is called Egbo, which is a mm-hmm. Ni- name from Nigeria, and it means forest or green. And we thought, ah, oh, okay. that kind of fits, because uh, Snow White has to run through a forest to get to the, the mm. house of the dwarfs. Um, <coughs> for example, Shakti, I believe, is a, is a name from, from uh, India uh, for boys and girls, and I think that means... Um, was it powerful or enlightened or something? It, 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 these names all yeah. have a um, hmm. fit to the story in somehow. Layla or Lila is, is um, means black hair or black. Uh, again, mm-hmm. she has black hair. It kind of fits. So all these names, um, yeah, they work in some some way and they fit into the story. Oh, wow, I I didn't think from that point of view at all. But you're right. Um, Shakti has a meaning. Agbo has a meaning. Akashi has a meaning. Layla yes. has a meaning. So that was kind of how we, we um, what we tried to do, and we wanted to the names. We wanted them to also represent different parts of the world, um, mm-hmm. like Tiago is a traditional name from from uh, Latin America or Latin speaking countries. Sabrina is a more European name, um, and so on and so on. Yeah, so um, the the experience with the dwarves. This is um, this also seems a bit fam- um, not familiar. Um, uh, the, the Snow White teaching. Yes, uh, so um, that was one of the other elements, right? When you come back to this, um, that the princesses are always very passive or they're always put in these traditional, old traditional roles that she had to, in the original version, she has to come and, and, and in order to live at the house, she has to cook and clean all day. Yeah. And we thought, okay, it's another one of these, uh, not stereotypes, but one of the things we didn't really want to reinforce. So, uh, we kind of went back to what happened at the beginning of the story is that her dad teaches, teaches her something. I yeah. want to have this nice dad moment. So he teaches her how to draw, read and write. And we thought, okay, now instead of her, when she comes to the dwarf's house, instead of her um, cooking all day and cleaning all day, why doesn't she use the skills she acquired and, and then teach them and give, passes them on? Because yeah. um, these, uh, the dwarfs, I think in the, also in the original, they come, they're kind of basically miners, right? They come from all over the world and they, they mine for gold. So, we thought, okay, maybe this could kind of fit. Um, mm. And that's why we want her to be something active and also kind of repair things around the house, just be a bit more independent. Yeah. I have to say I'm really impressed with um, 
the more I think about it, the, the, there is actually a lot of depth to it. Um, when I first heard about Fairy Tales Retold, I was yeah. kind of like, oh no, like, oh, please don't spoil them. <laughs> um, but the, the hearing the story, reading it, and now talking to you, um, there's definitely a lot in there. Um, we just talked about diversity and inclusion, but now this part as well, where in the original story, kind of you get this subconscious sense that being fair and well off is a, is a good way to be, um, and the opposite is being uh, being servant to somebody else. Mm. Um, and in in this way, what what you have changed here is that you can actually have a pretty fulfilling and interesting life outside the castle as well, um, and you still have <laughs> certain gifts to give. It's not princess or servant. Yes, and I think a lot of times. Right, you have this kind of, especially in Germany, you have this, or, or also in, Europe, in the US, where everybody always wants to go to university and says, oh, you need to study in university, it's just it's being academic. But there's so many other jobs, right, that are really fulfilling, that are uh, have a service to society that are much, um, maybe much better to do or much <laughs> shouldn't be looked down upon, right? And that's kind of uh, one of the things, uh, you, as you said, you alluded to it, but one of the things you can, can show. Um, yeah, and... and um, the, the trick, or what we're trying to do, which is, is um, kind of try to have these elements and change them, and but not be them, not have them be so in your face, right? It should be a natural kind right. of. It should naturally fit into the story. Uh, and again, uh, like what you said, you hear the idea or the name, you think, oh, I hope they didn't do this. We get this a lot in, in Germany. The people yeah. think, oh, I hope they didn't um, put the gender stamps in. You know, with the, the, when they um, mm -hmm. when you don't write, uh, you write Lehrer star yeah. in, right they hope yeah. oh, i hope we didn't do that or or it's not mm. something that's snow white but in in new york 2020 right people are really people are really uh, are very uh connected to these stories and they really yeah. uh, they protect them right in the way yeah. and they don't they, they're really uh, sometimes um, a bit worried that hey i hope they didn't screw this up <laughs> <laughs> no i can totally Im um, imagine this feeling and and by the way i grew up in pakistan i did not grow up with these fairy tales i read them as an adult um, but i had that reaction so i can only imagine somebody really reading the uh, the grim versions uh, in their childhood yeah and i think what is this one of the things that the thoughts that really got me at the beginning is for example in western europe or the us um most kids from the age of five six can finish a sentence mirror mirror on the wall right here in, in europe definitely wow and if you think about the impact that had and i mean with what is that the case how many sentences i can go up to a stranger and he can complete my sentence how but how many things is that the case uh, yeah. at least in europe uh, or and then you realize what kind of impact this had mm. uh, on kids yeah. and and that was something that blew my mind a bit because you, you don't you don't think about it too much but even boys, I mean, everybody knows these stories, right? Everybody knows Cinderella. Everybody knows, at least, again, in, in Western Europe and, and, and the U.S., everybody um, grows up with them. And then the thought is, hey, if you if you make that little change and just imagine, that, let's say, 10, 15 years from now, these, these our stories will be still exist and still be read. Maybe a parent comes in and thinks, hey, what version should I get? Should I get the traditional one or should I get the one that's maybe a bit more uh, yeah. timely? Um Now that's um, that's an amazing uh, amazing thought. Um, Haribo came to my mind. Um, that's Haribo. another sentence. Yeah, a lot of people can complete that sentence. Uh, <laughs> <I> yes, <don't laughs> <know. laughs> Haribo must Yeah, that's true. Um, <laughs> but uh, to your point, um, let's talk a bit about um, the stories and their lessons. Right, a lot of the stories, in a way, are archetypal stories. They they are consolidation of various experiences put all together into one um, and the lessons people probably drawn uh, drew from them in the past um, brothers Grimm kind of are are not um, in a way they are not equivalent to Aesop they are a lot more creative Aesop mm -hmm. seems to be um, more like here's an event to tell you this moral um, yeah. brothers Grimm kind of went a bit further um, but still kind of seems like the the consciousness of the 18th century was still very much about um, being being well off and men taking care of women uh, in a way. I mean, what I've learned, because I didn't really think about this too much before we start, because uh, mm. I think 
most people don't, but um, most of these, like the Brother Grimm stories, most of these tales were mm -hmm. traditionally originally um, written for, for adults, not for kids. Yeah. Uh, that was the original point. And they were, mm. as you said, they were meant to, to show really simple kind of concept. Hey, uh, good and bad. Uh, if, if you don't do the right thing, you get punished, usually very brutally. Um, mm. Be afraid of outsiders, usually, right? Everything, everything that's not, that you don't know is typically uh, something evil. Um, and it's probably because at that time the society was much, much close, much less connected, right? You had these little towns everywhere. Yeah. You weren't, you didn't meet that many foreigners, so you were automatically mm -hmm. skeptical and you were taught to be afraid or, or be very cautious of them. And I think these stories represent that in a way. And then over time they mm -hmm. were, they were, not, they didn't become stories for adults, but they just became stories for kids. Um, but a lot of these elements still, um, still yeah. have remained. And that's also why they're, in terms of the way they're drawn, uh, they were so very bland, bland I guess is the word, uh, in terms mm. of the way the characters look. Um, yeah. So they want, they sh they're supposed to s uh, scare people, say, hey, you better do what is right. You better listen to, uh, to the boss, mm -hmm. so to speak. Um, yeah, and that, that's kind of how, um, how they evolved uh, or, or what, what the origin is. And then you say, okay, this was 200 years ago. Maybe now it's time to... to um, Speak them a bit. Yeah, uh, <coughs> yeah, for, for sure. Um, the it it seems that um in a way what what brothers Grimm were were coming to with a lot of these stories, as you said, um the towns were not as connected, but the town life itself was very much dependent on each other. Um, and in a way, a lot of the stories seem to be warnings about what not to do. Uh, yeah. Do not get too greedy. Do not leave home. Do not go close to the well. Um, yeah. You know, do not speak to strangers. Do not uh, take without permission. Th um, all of these things, or do not um, make the evil witch angry. Um, all, all of these different things are are all about preserving your life and uh, peace in the community. Because every time you deviate, you kind of put yourself and others in in danger. Um, and True. It makes sense that um, kind of um, 200 years later where we have social security and life is a lot more connected, we can leave towns. Most of us have that possibility, especially um, in, in Europe or in the first world. Kind of um, those lessons have to change one way or another. <laughs> the focus, focus changes from perhaps, yeah. Yeah, and exactly. And, and one of these, as you said before, one of the... Uh things is the, 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 um, the role of woman, right? You're always very, mm -hmm. back then, very passive. You didn't have, women didn't have a chance to, to say, hey, I'm the boss, so I want this. They, they had to mm -hmm. raise kids, do, do run the household. That, that was it. That was kind of, uh, there wasn't many chances to kind of go beyond that. And I think a lot of these stories, and the woman, typically they should be happy. Oh, some uh, if a prince came and found me and uh, I'm now married. That that should be my mm -hmm. goal in life, right? But that is not yeah. obviously no longer the case, thank God. Uh, and that's one of these elements um, that should be changed, right? Why, is, uh, yeah, why does it always have to be saved and kissed and not have any say in their own what happens to them? Um, mm -hmm. And why does the man always have to be strong, right? Or why does the prince never cry? All these little things. Um, and that's again, what we wanted to kind of play with and, and um, adjust um, because mm -hmm. it's just something that's not necessarily uh, needed anymore uh, yeah. in today's world. So I'm, um, I'm leaving out the ending of the uh, retelling of the story on purpose, unless you want to give it away. I, I want the, the readers to go to your website and figure it out for themselves. Um, there's, there's definitely a few interesting things there that um, I'm going to talk to you offline. Um, <laughs> um, um, how, how do you, um, what kind of lessons were you seeing in the older story or older stories, if you want to talk about Cinderella now? Um, and um, just to kind of recap, what are the new values that you see that need to be highlighted, not necessarily replace the older ones? <laughs> so I think there's two things. One is, um, a visual element, how you draw the stories, because it has yeah. a big impact and it says a lot, and the other one is, is what you write. Um, so visually, the, the, what we're going to do with each story is just have them, a, have them in this, in this fairy tale setting, of course, but as you talked about now many times, just show diversity and just show um, empowering characters. Mm -hmm. um, 
just because there's no reason not to have it, and and it's also fun, right? It, it's a it's a challenge to come up with all these characters, but it, it's just uh, it's a representation of today, and I think it, the genie is not going to get back in the bottle, right? The, the world is connected, the world yeah. is, is interchanged, and um, I think the big picture is also good for everyone that, that, that people. Um, Different cultures meet, help each other, learn, etc. So that's visually we always want to have that, um, or we will, we will always have that in the stories. And then the the second element is, what what messages do we want to, um, what do we want to update? Uh, yeah. And again, the goal is we really want to try to keep stories recognizable, and and include changes that you at first maybe don't even realize. Like as you said, like with the the skin color or, or the, mm -hmm. the how we change that or that. Um, explaining and giving characters a little bit more depth so now with each series you're going to have um one or two major themes so again right uh, snow white was the, the bravery um cinderella will be the the, um, the story about uh, self-confidence and and kind of true love uh, the next one which is going to be um the little mermaid is going to be it's a traditionally it's not a grim story it's an anderson story but it's a story that is very sad actually at the end and it's it's a mm -hmm. perfect Sadly, it's a perfect story, we think, where you can introduce elements of climate change and global warming and can kind of mm -hmm. uh, show kids the effect of it and kind of um, leave it open-ended because that's what it is at the moment. Say, hey, how are we going to deal with this? Are we going to be able to fix this or not? Um, and so that's yeah. kind of what we want to do uh, with each story. Um, and we've written a couple other ones already. And the goal is that, yeah, we have maybe, that we might be able to do two a year in terms of write and publish. Um, but then again, then each story we have one or two uh, main themes. Um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. Uh, yeah, <coughs> but yeah, these are the kind of the three uh, current ones. Sweet, I'm really excited about um, the new stories now, and I really look forward to <laughs> listening to them or reading them. Um, I want to ask, what has um. Have there been any kind of surprising um, epiphanies or lessons or things for you um, in, in any of this process? I mean, um, from the customer experience side, I've never worked on something where the reaction reaction was so strong and positive. Yeah. Right. Where mm. really have everybody, not everybody, but I would say, again, we've talked to now, done this now for two years, we've probably talked to three, 4,000 people because we have... Each weekend we go to markets and, and, and sell and talk to people. Mm -hmm. uh, and just uh, parents, uh, just for example, one, one of the first weekends we had somebody, buy, a woman buy the book, uh, and then two hours later she came back, she said, oh, I, was, I just sat down to read it, and I was crying because it, it, it meant so much. And then you realize, wow. I think especially for women, this whole thing about the whole this whole pressure of, of beauty and the way you look, it, it's just something men, I mean, just don't have no idea uh, there's a tremendous pressure that there is or, or maybe it's subconscious but that really surprised me is how many people are affected by these stories how many people yeah. uh, either how many parents either don't read fairy tales anymore uh, because they just don't agree with them or they're too outdated too too violent or how many people do it themselves that they change stories i was really surprised and, and the other thing that was really it's really fun to see is just the effect on kids um so, for example, yeah. my daughter, for, for a while after we did it, it was an exciting project, but then she was, you know, when she was, uh, when she was brave, she was like Snow White. It was a really cool role model. And you see how easy yeah. that, uh, how just changing little things, how, how, what a big impact that has. And then when we talk to, when we go to kindergartens and schools and kind of talk about the project or introduce our project, it's incredible to, to see the kids' questions. And, and a lot of boys say, ah, oh, so they don't have to get married at the end, or they don't have to kiss. And you just see how, wow. how even at this age, five, six, seven, it, it's really it's something they think about. Or the girls yeah. are excited, saying, ah, she's not just, she's not just uh, she has an agency, she can do something with, with herself. Uh, that's really, really um, positively uh, surprised us. Just the, the, the level of, of um, feedback and, and how, how positive it has been so far. It's really, yeah, it, it, I've never seen that with any other project I've worked on. So it's really cool to see. Yeah, that's that's amazing. Um, you you kind of mentioned in passing that every um, every week you go to the market and sell the books, and um, I have seen you there. And there's <laughs> yes, something fascinating 
um, to me about that experience of being out there, you know, putting up your own posters or really being in front of the customers. Tell us a bit more about that. That was, that's actually kind of a business lesson because you were, I think, at the beginning asking about business. So with my, the first business I did myself, I was kind of, it's also probably cultural. I was too shy. It's hard to promote yourself. It's hard to say, hey, we have the best product, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, some people or some cultures are better at that than others. In Germany, it's probably not so much. Um, so and with this time around, we said, hey, look, we believe in this product. We have to be proactive to promote it because otherwise, how do you find stuff? There's so much content, so much, so many images. There's so much out yeah. there. It, it's You just get lost in, in the masses. So we have to be a bit more proactive uh, and not be afraid to kind of say, hey, look at us or, or at least read and, see, and give us feedback. Um, and then in terms of how we sell the book, right? So we know, okay, online eventually is going to be uh, the biggest um, source of sales, but... Um, we live in the city in Berlin. Uh, I, uh, here, every weekend where I live, we have a market, and I always saw people selling things. And I thought, hey, just for fun, while we while we're new, let's get a market stall and and kind of have the book there. And then we get feedback. We can kind of it's nice. You can you can test what what elements uh, of the story uh, people um, connect with, and that, yeah. can, uh, that can help you online in terms of marketing. This is selling points. Um, but in the end, what happened is it turned into one of our main sources of of, of, uh, of main selling uh, venue because one, you have no competition on the market, right? You have other people selling jewelry, selling food, etc. But not many people sell books or just have a focus yeah. on one kind of book or one series. And then when you have people, when you, when people stop, you have the chance. You need maybe thirty seconds. You have the chance to talk to them and really face to face introduce the idea to them. Yeah. And that's really nice because if you go to a bookstore, you have a thousand competitors, right? At the market, you have them in front of you. Usually they have kids there as well. Um, and you can explain to them and they can look at it and feel it. And, and it's, it's a much, I think, a much easier sales process. Um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, it's just now become, and I think uh, it's kind of a, a, a because we're not a, we're a tiny, tiny company, we, we don't, uh, one of the problems is distribution getting into bookstores. Typically, that's done by the big um, publishing houses or by um, the uh, one or two kind of distribution companies that, that bring books to bookstores. But we're too small. We, we cannot. We don't fit into the model. We're not part of that system. So we have to find different ways of selling. Um, and that's one of the ways. And the plan is to kind of to expand it a bit. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's, imp that's impressive. Um, I, I can totally see the... the the fact of people actually stopping by and uh, feeling the books in their hands and seeing the illustrations and talking to you, um, not having a hundred thousand other books around you <laughs> yeah, is a good. completely different feeling. Um, and, and you're in the market. Um, I think um, for the kids, uh, it must be fascinating that they finally see something that is very much for them and for adults yeah, um, probably um, um, awakens their own inner child as well for that moment. Um, and you get user research done. Yeah, exactly. You get really uh, proper feedback. I mean, of course, you have people that don't like it, and and, uh, and and especially in Berlin, they're very direct. They tell you, oh, this is terrible. You shouldn't be doing this. Uh, but again, it's good. <laughs> it kind of, it uh, you learn, right? And you, you understand a bit more where people are coming from. And mostly that people are quite protective of these stories. Like they grew up with them. It means a lot to them. So naturally, they're, they're protective, and they want to make sure they, they're not messed with too much. <laughs> <laughs> indeed, <coughs> indeed. Um, so, one of the last questions as we come closer to our, to our one hour mark. Yeah. What is your vision with this? So, kind of the the, the dream is that we can somehow have an impact, right? That uh, mm -hmm. even just these little changes collectively, they can impact uh, individual kids, but also a kind of a bigger picture. That's why. Uh, on one hand, we said, okay, let's just not do one, but let's do a little series and really um, focus on, on issues that are that affect kids. You know? uh, beauty, again, self-confidence, global warming, etc. And, and kind of package them into stories that they know and feel comfortable with. And our dream is really that maybe in five, ten years, uh, uh, yeah, as I said earlier, people pick up and they think about, wow, which fairy tale, that A, they want to buy fairy tales again, and then they think about, hey, which one do I want to uh by and that then it's it's it creates positive positive role models and and, and allows kids to think because that's what we've noticed when we go to kindergarten or school schools you say hey it doesn't always have to be this way 
and for example, she can be she doesn't have to be the prettiest, but she can be the bravest, or the the prince doesn't always have to rescue. And you can see in the in the kids' heads like ah, oh. and you can see like the the, the it's starting yeah. to kind of the imagination or the, the eyes starting to kind of glow and like ah, oh, this is awesome. This is exactly. Mm. Um, I think we can have a tiny. The hope is that we have a tiny bit of a positive impact on making the world a tiny bit better, one book at a time or one story at a time. <laughs> Uh, that would be really cool. That would be really cool. Well, more power to you. And um, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm definitely fascinated by, by the entire project, and um, we'll keep an eye on every book. So, two more questions. Um, sure. One you won't have to think much about. So <laughs> that's for the end. Um, if you, um, if you had a giant billboard, hmm. um, of which millions of people would walk past. Right, but it is a billboard. It's not a book, um, so it's a different yeah. challenge. It's a Twitter challenge, perhaps. What would you put on it? In order to market ourselves, or uh, well, this, or you, you have the entire world passing by it. So <laughs> this is your message to the world. Oh, that's a hard one. I mean, I guess an, an easy way to market ourselves, we probably create like a just a sentence. How it all started. Uh, Mirror me on the wall. Who is the prettiest of them all? Cross out pretty, and and kind of like cross it out and and with a mm. with a pencil type and write and who is the bravest, and mm. uh, maybe with it with it with it uh, with a smiley that that smiles just to get people thinking. Um, maybe that's the the cop mm. out, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> otherwise I have to think a bit longer about mm. the <laughs> about yeah, question. Yeah. yeah. No, it, it's it's amazing. Um, what I love about this conversation is, um, I know I have talked a lot, but it's been easy. And the way I relate to all of this conversation is, you know, you go to a, um, to a gallery and you look at a painting, and a whole world starts up in your mind, right? And you have yeah. no idea if that is what the artist meant. <laughs> yes, but, that's true. Um, and in a way, now I'm talking to the artist and saying, well, this is what I read when I read this part, and. I have no idea what you're thinking. Oh, wow, this guy missed the point. Or <laughs> no, there's 10 other things. Um, so with the billboard, I, I'm already imagining a bunch of things. Yeah, okay. um, thank you. Yeah, we also, uh, on a side note, we also hit a lot of little references in the book to friends and family and friends that helped us that uh, will not be apparent to anyone, but just for fun. Because uh, Ah, sweet. Yeah. Um, but yeah, no, it's, it's, um, it's a definitely a passion project for, for, for us. Uh, also for uh, Claudia, who's an illustrator, and um, I hope that you can uh, the kids can see it or, or feel it, um, mm -hmm. and you really think about a lot of how, how what we want to say and how, how things should look, and um, yeah. Awesome. So the last question is: um, Could you tell our um, audience where they can find you? Sure. Uh, as you said uh, on the website, it's fairytales-retold dot com or Märchen neu erzählt. Or on uh, Instagram, that's our kind of the, the main platform, um, Fairy Tales Retold, or hashtag Fairy Tales Retold. And then if you're in Berlin, uh, if you want to personally see us, uh, definitely come to uh, Boxy uh, every Saturday or Mauer Parks on Sunday, and you will find us. You'll see a, a store with lots of books and funny characters. Amazing. <laughs> um, I, I, um, I hope a lot of the listeners... Um, we do have a lot of listeners in Berlin. Uh, we'll find you um, at the stall and we'll get to enjoy the stories. Stefan, this has been amazing. Thank you so much for the hour. Well, thank you for your time and also uh, stopping by and reading the book. And it's really, really been nice. And I'm glad uh, we somehow met uh, via the factory. Right? <laughs> it, indeed. <laughs> so thanks to the factory network as well. Um, and we're going we're gonna to meet again and continue this journey. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to to the audience, the listeners. Yes. Um, Thank you, everybody, for listening. So have a beautiful day, and um, see you around. Bye-bye. Tschüss. Auf Wiedersehen. Ciao.